good. All right, so first, um, testing. How many of you wrote tests and did software testing before? Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> okay. You haven't wrote tests uh, for software systems before? Seriously? <laughs> so I was not a big fan of writing tests. Um, there is a question. Yeah, it's fine, Cora, of course. Yeah, thanks. Um, I was actually not a big fan of writing tests when I was a student. Uh, I thought, yeah, it's kind of a waste of time. You just write what you need to write and then submit it and then that's it. Uh, but it turns out when you're working on slightly more complex pro progr programs, uh, you notice that you spend quite a lot of time debugging and like fixing things. Uh, and you can prevent it by simply writing tests. So today's lecture is a little bit about why we do testing and what are the benefits. And of course, there is a little bit of a theory uh, behind software testing and system testing. So why do we, why is the software testing important? Sec slide two. Um, you can, as a programmer, you can mess up things much more than um, you would kind of in your normal life because software has such a huge impact on so many aspects, right? So one of the biggest um, software failures was in 2003. I, I haven't updated the, the slides. Maybe they have been uh, newer ones, which were bigger than that. Um, but there was um, uh, there were some fatalities and there were kind of a lot of um, resources lost because there was a, a software failure which resulted in the you know energy blackout. Um, so slide three. Um, for many years, people didn't realize that there is an ozone layer hole uh, because they thought it was a, just an anomaly of the sensors that have recorded the data. So the data was suggesting that the, there was a ozone layer hole in 78, but it took us, you know, seven years to realize that that, that actually is true because uh, people were kind of neglecting um, that anomaly and the software was actually ignoring it. So there was, you know, um, a software layer which was basically kind of uh, averaging and removing that particular anomaly, which turned out to be a very serious problem. Slide four, um, a very typical example of software failure was a race condition in the Terak 36 machine. So if a, a race condition is a very difficult bug to find, uh, it occurs only in certain circumstances and it's not easily reproducible because you have to have those circumstances exactly the, the same way. So in this particular case, if there was a particular sequence of keys strokes um, within a particular time frame, it was causing kind of a pop-up uh, a window, which was causing another process to wait for something. And then another process, which was kind of uh, reading the, the memory, um, the variable name of the variable value was actually reading it before the value was stored. So there was a race condition and the value read was wrong. And because the, the value that was read was wrong, it kind of resulted in the dosage of radiation, which was exceeding the, uh, the allowed um, magnitude. And then again, you had three, three fatalities. So you may think, well, you know, some software bugs are kind of um, harmless. Uh, people can work around them and they can kind of, they will not cause serious problems, but in the real world settings, in the real world situations, uh, they will cause a lot of problems. And those three examples kind of demonstrate that software is everywhere. Like you have software in your ABS brakes in your car, you have software in, um, you know, in even in your cattle, which kind of checks at which temperature it should turn itself off. So software kind of in modern days, you, you will realize that it's, pretty much everywhere. Um, and testing and software bugs are kind of uh, an important topic. So we have um, 
different perspectives on 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 testing um so there is um um a domain right so in computer science you have those kind of domains you can be uh, a kind of a core programmer or web developer or you can be dealing with database designs or you can be architecting the systems but there is kind of a domain which is actually called testing uh, and you can be a full-time tester um, and that is kind of uh, an, op an opportunity to, to make a career out of this uh, so the tester is the kind of a link between who is using the system and who is building the system uh, and usually the the users are kind of partially testing the capabilities of the of the software and the tester is sort of testing the whole plethora of different uh, uh, aspects of the system uh, typically in our settings the developers are the testers uh, that's usually not the case in business world so in the commercial software development usually you have test testers which are not involved in development uh, why is that why do you think is that that the testers are kind of independent from the development of the from the developing and development of the of the system itself would it make more more sense that the people who are building it and developing it are actually testing it as well what do you think zoom people so those of you who tested software uh did you um basically when writing tests confirmed what you knew was already working there is a kind of a yeah exactly so uh sindra is suggesting that the developers know the limits of the software and they know what will work and they kind of know what will not work and uh they write tests in a way that confirms what they already know and some of that may be subconscious and some of that may be kind of just a bias right uh it happened to me i had um i was involved in developing quite a complex um software uh solution for uh, financial operations and i kind of uh needed to make sure that it, it works and i had maybe 250 tests which were validating different aspects of the of the software uh, and all of them were passing fine but there was kind of a one small assumption which i made uh, which was wrong uh, and i made it subconsciously i kind of didn't realize that i made that assumption and when there were when after a while we discovered the bug uh, it turned out that this assumption kind of uh, was affecting like 30 tests and uh, when you take this assumption out all those 30 tests were just wrong because they were relying on that assumption uh, and they shouldn't so just a single bug resulted in like 30 tests failing because i had to i had a bug in tests right um, so people who are not involved in development they don't have that bias they just expect the system to do what it should do and they don't have this sort of uh, constraints and, and and biases that you have as a as a developer all right so let's move to slide six uh so software testing is quite a complex phenomenon um so you can look at it from different perspectives uh, and you can uh look at it from within the perspective you can categorize it in different categories uh, and it is sort of expected uh, that you have a general understanding of what those are. So you can sort of um, look at testing from the perspective of uh, knowing insides of the system or not knowing it. So we have tests which we categorize as uh, black box testing. And that means you don't care and you don't know how things actually are implemented and how they work. You're just testing it as if it was a black box. Um, the other perspective is that you know that you know that the system is composed of certain things and they are supposed to communicate or they are supposed to do certain things and that's called white box, box testing so white box testing is different from black box testing because for white box testing you need to understand how the system works inside not only from the outside then we have another perspective that we can look at the tests and that's the level or the scope of what is being tested 
So obviously you can test the entire system. You can do some kind of a acceptance tests or user tests on the entire system from the perspective of the user. Uh, and those are the, the most uh, high level, the most comprehensive tests. But then you can kind of go down and test particular module. So you can test a particular module in isolation and test another module in isolation. Then you can look inside the module and test particular objects or classes or functions. Uh, and then you can kind of go all the way down to some units of tests. And units of tests are usually classes or functions or methods that you have in your code. Um, so this is sort of at which granularity you're sort of doing the tests. And then you can have different non-functional testing. Like you can test the system for performance or you can check or test the system for security. Uh, you can uh, test the system of when it will fail. So do some sort of a stress, stress testing. Uh, there is a popular method of testing software uh, which evolved over the, the, the last, I don't know, 10 years, which is called fuzzing. So you basically take the system and you provide all possible inputs to the system to check what will happen when very unusual inputs are given, right? So for example, you can generate, you know, at random millions and millions of PDF documents and feed it into a PDF reader and see what happens to see, will the software fail? Will the software have some, uh, you know, uh, vulnerabilities? What, what will happen to, to the software? Uh, it's, sometimes we, we have a variation of that called monkey testing. So you basically have like maybe a dialogue box or something, and then you just throw random inputs into the system to see is the system handling the inputs correctly and, and so on. So there are kind of a different perspective on testing and different ways of categorizing what software testing is. So I'm, I'm just kind of a trying to portray that it is quite a complex, um, complex domain. Slide number seven. Um, so um, you also can use testing as a form of quality assurance, right? Um, so we have, um, you, you can, uh, let me see if there is a, yeah. So there are different, um, you, you can build something and test, integrity and test if the thing that you've built does what you wanted it to do. But you can also test if what you have been building fulfills the requirements of the user, right? So you have kind of um, um, quality assurance that makes sure that the software that has been um, constructed fulfills the requirements, the initial requirements of the user. And that's usually what's called uh, acceptance testing. Um, so what, um, what are the kind of our dimensions or metrics that we use for software quality? Slides eight and nine, there is kind of a number of them. So we have correctness. Um, so that's a metric to which extent um, as I said, like the, the thing that was constructed satisfies the requirements. So was it kind of con constructed correctly or does it or not? It does not fulfill the requirements. Uh, usability, so how quick, you know, how effectively the user can use it. Maintainability, that's uh, how uh, easy is to introduce new features or how easy is to fix bugs and how easy is to maintain the system. Um, flexibility. So if you need to introduce a new uh, module or new feature, how difficult is that? How much impact it will have on the rest of the system? Um, performance, we already did that. Testability. So ability to test the system is one of the quality metrics, right? Uh, Reliability, how well the system performs and reusability, how easy is to reuse the particular module or system in a different context. So all those are kind of um, quality metrics, but you know, pay attention that testability, ability to test the system is one of them, right? Uh, so 
when you're developing a more complex solution, a more complex software system, you will realize that there is um, sort of an, an easy and fast way of implementing it. But then when you need to test it, it's kind of hard. Or you can try to incorporate some of the testing philosophy or testing uh, capabilities early on. And then as, you, as your software grows and as it becomes more and more complex, you will kind of add tests and make it sort of uh, convenient for, uh, to satisfy the testability criteria, right? Um, all right, so there is this kind of uh, verification versus validation, right? So verification is um, answering a question, are we building the product right, right? So verification is for correctness. So you're checking if the function which should add two numbers adds two numbers, right? Uh, validation is, do we really need a function which adds two numbers, right? Validation is kind of level up. It's about asking a question whether what you're building is the right thing. You can build correctly and, uh, uh, and verify it, uh, verify the correctness of it, of something that you don't need, of something that is wrong for that particular purpose, right? So you, you need both. You need verification and validation. Um, you often see it, uh, especially with uh, some of the commercial software, that one or the other is kind of broken, right? So sometimes you have systems which have functions which nobody uses, like you ask, why would you have that here? And sometimes the, the stuff that should work a certain way doesn't work that way. So you, you know, in validating uh, verification and validation at the same time. Um, all right, so how do we do um, software testing? So I, I kind of mentioned the job, like you can be a tester, you can sit down and test the system. That's one, one way. Um, you can do reviews. So you can, uh, for example, check, um, um, like observe or check the, the code uh, with uh, additional pair of eyes. Um, but testing is, yeah. Okay, let's have uh, slide number 11. So that's, uh, you, I'm sure you, you know this joke is like how different stakeholders uh, see, uh, see the system and then the, Validation and verification are both important, but the uh, validation is the kind of a top level check, right? Um, that what has been built is actually correct or, or needed for that particular purpose. Um, okay, so slide 12, uh, we have, um, we have, um, a quote from Jaikstra that um, program testing can um, demonstrate the presence of bugs, but it cannot um, kind of uh, demonstrate their absence. And that is uh, true, uh, but that suggests that the only way to kind of have bug free software is to do formal verification of the, of the software solution, right? And we have been working on formal verifications of software for the last you know, 40 years, and it's hard. Uh, for simple systems, it, it is doable, but for more complex software, it's, it's a goal that uh, is yeah, not, uh, not possible yet. So uh, you have to do tests to eliminate some classes of bugs and some, um, some problems that uh, are easily patched with, um, with testing. Um, all right, so slide 13. Um, as I said, you can do kind of inspection and reviews uh, and kind of uh, visually inspect the code or um, you know, uh, test some of the functionality. And the advantages are that you spread the knowledge of your, of your team. So if you're working on a project with uh, multiple developers or multiple stakeholders, then you kind of are uh, learning about how things work and what is where. Uh, but there is um, there is a kind of a cost associated with it uh, because it's slow uh, and it's kind of different, difficult to incorporate um, 
different perspectives uh, along the development process of the of the software. So another one is I mentioned functional and black box testing. So you don't you you try to kind of uh, provide a framework where you know what to expect, and then you uh, provide some sort of inputs and let the system respond, and then you check if the expected inputs is what you got or whether you're getting anomalies or outputs. Uh, that type of testing can be done uh, manually, but it can be automated. Um, and that's the most um, uh, popular or the, the, the most typical way of, uh, of, testing, um, uh, of testing software. Um, so the advantages is that you can kind of test the system concurrently and you can run um, multiple uh, tests at the same time. So it's very robust. It adheres really easy to automation. So you can kind of uh, provide frameworks that run a large number of those tests automatically. Uh, and the tests are often independent of the actual implementation. So for example, if you wrote a test for your function, um, then the way the function is implemented is kind of independent of the test. So usually where you re-implement your function, the test is still valid and you can still apply it. Um, so this is probably the testing uh, setup that you've used. And those of you who wrote tests is probably a lot, you know, following that, uh, that methodology. Uh, you wrote some test cases and they said, if you put this into the function, you should get this as a result or if you put this into this dialog box, this should happen, right? Um, so um, then we have uh, a concept of equivalence testing. So imagine that you have a function uh, that you need to test and that function can take um, you know, uh, natural numbers. So you're asking a user for an age and you want to see if your software kind of handles that correctly, right? Um, then it doesn't make sense to have a test function which goes you know, from minus infinity to plus infinity uh, because that would take you forever to test your particular function. Uh, so you need to test the function on a sample data, but the sample should be designed in such a way that you're covering the range that you typically would get, right? Um, so you want, to, you want to partition the test space into particular classes and select one indiv individual example from those classes such that you have kind of the maximum value from doing the test. It will be kind of clearer if we go to slide 16 and we have um, a simple question. So assume that you have, uh, let me see, Assume that you have written an application that instructor can use to enter student marks. Each student mark is within the range zero to 100. Um, so we have a function which expects numbers from zero to 100 and does some calculations with it, right? So then what would be the kind of the, how many tests would you need to do? How many values would you need to test to have confidence that the function handles the inputs correctly? Right, so we have um, we have um, numbers from zero to hundred. Sorry. Um, so the question is, how many how many tests, like how many values would you like to test? Yeah. Which ones? Okay. So one suggestion is to test for sorry for zero and. 100 okay those are the edge values right that's good but what if you enter minus one you haven't tested outside the ranges right yeah yeah so I think you you have to test here 
we have to test here. It would be good to test somewhere in the middle, but you also need to test here and here. So just to show that you do have this if statement inside your methods to eliminate possible uh, mistakes, right? So if this if the grade is entered and it's outside of the expected range, your software may throw an exception or it may do something, right? So if you have some sort of division or, or, or whatever, and then you enter zero, it may blow up, right? If you enter a negative number, it may calculate the score for incorrectly if, you know, for whatever reason, right? So your function should check if the score is between, 100, uh, between zero and 100, and then within that range operates do the calculations correctly, but it should also handle the cases where the data was entered incorrectly, right? So in, in, in this particular case, we sort of have one, two, three, four, or five. It's kind of good to take uh, one value from the middle because the edge cases might be handled separately inside the, inside the function itself, right? So for example, for zero, as I was saying, you may have to have if the value is zero, do this, a separate calculation, right? Uh, because there might be division by the value you've entered. And then if it's, the, if it's the zero, then you cannot do certain things. The same for this one. So often for those two cases, you have an if statement or you have something that does something special. And then for this, you have the, the normal behavior. And then for this, you have some sort of exceptional behavior. Does it make sense? So then you have sort of like, five partition classes such that if you test with those five values, then you sort of have confidence that your method implementation is robust enough that it should handle all possible cases, right? If you test it for minus one and it correctly detected that it's outside of the range that you have confidence that if we entered minus 100, it will also handle it correctly, right? Same, same here. You don't need more than just one example. You can, but you don't, typically need. All right, so let's go to slide number 17. Um, so then we have a concept of um, structure, structural testing or white box testing. Um, we um, sometimes do that as well. Uh, we can automate it too. Uh, and it is similar to the previous case, but with, the, with, the, with this case, you basically have kind of one step. So you say, given this, I expect this to happen. Um, but with structural tests, you're sort of checking what is the flow, what is the information flow, or what is happening inside the, the system, such that you're checking, you're testing kind of the um, um, individual aspects of the flow, right? So at each decision point or each if statement or at each I don't know, choice, you're testing if the software is making the correct decision, right? Um, all right, there is kind of a, a metric which is called um, test coverage. So test cover. Yeah, sorry for this. Uh, test cover is a metric of how much code are your test covering. So how much code execution of test touches in your code base such that you have kind of a, an understanding of how much you've tested, right? And that is in percentage. So it can be, you know, 50%. What does it tell you? That you have, let's say, 1,000 lines of code, and when you test, 500 of them are executed, right? Uh, you don't know if you're testing everything with those 500 lines, but at least you kind of have a, a, an expectation that you've run those 500 lines, right? So for example, if I have a function, um, so I have some function f, and then I have an if statement, and then I have um, the block for true and a block for false, right? Uh, and if I run the test, and uh, let's say, um, whatever, like this is 20 lines, this is 20 lines, and then we have some lines extra, right? So when I run a test, and it tells me, well, you're testing 80% or 60% of that function, then I know that my tests are only testing one of the branches, right? But if, if the test says, okay, you have 100%, 
for that function that I know I'm testing both branches, right? I'm testing sometimes the true and sometimes false conditions. So this test cover is a kind of a good metric to, um, to keep in mind when you're writing your tests, because if you added more tests, but your test coverage stayed the same, maybe that was not that useful, right? Maybe you should focus more on trying to increase the test coverage of your tests. So for your projects, uh, we will ask you like, um, what is the test coverage for your tests such that you will have kind of a, uh, an understanding of, of how much you've tested, but also that's kind of an ex extra expense or budget that you need to allocate to writing those tests, right? So having 100% uh, test cover is very expensive uh, because that means you have to write very detailed tests which test everything, right? Uh, which is time consuming and sometimes unnecessary. Uh, so for example, if you, have, if you have a main function, right? And the main function sets things up and starts your system, uh, obviously, your unit test will almost never test that function, right? Uh, because all your unit tests will test some of the aspects of, of what this function is using, but not this function itself. So your test coverage will be less than 100%. Um, so what we want you to do is you, we want you to discuss and set kind of a budget saying our goal is let's say 80% test coverage, right? Or 85% test coverage or our budget is initially to have a test cover of 50% and increase it by 5% every sprint, such that we kind of get to 80% at the end of the project, right? So you can design a strategy and you can design how you want to, uh, how you want to handle that. All right, so um, there is a kind of a slide 18 uh, difference between uh, black box or white box testing, like what do you choose? I think um, you sort of um, choosing depending on the, yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah, you kind of don't know. Uh, so it depends on the type of the system that you're developing, right? So for example, when we were developing that financial piece of software, we wanted to have 95% test coverage. Uh, we wanted really high standards such that we are kind of are dealing with uh, most of the use cases being covered. Uh, if you're developing a game or if you're developing a system where uh, the possible mistakes are less you know, impactful, then your test coverage can be lower. Uh, so the good indicator is <clears throat> when you start writing tests and you, you write the initial set of tests, uh, which you feel are the most important, then you will have kind of a baseline, right? So when you, when you have your system and then you have your most important tests and those tests are like 50%, then you know, you're kind of, you have quite a long way of kind of unimportant functionality. But if your most important tests are like 80% that you know, you want to keep your software to higher standards. That's why I said, usually what you do is you, you start and then you check what is your test cover. And then from there, you kind of have a feeling of what you, where you want to be, right? So for example, if, you're, if, you're, if you started and your test cover is 50%, but every week you're finding bugs, every week you're finding things to fix, then you know, okay, we really need higher standards. Like you want the test cover to be such that you don't have a frequent occurrence of new bugs introduced in your software, right? So it's trial and error a little bit. Like it's, it's not easy to, to have a metric, but there are some rules of thumb, right? So a rule of thumb of 80% is a kind of a good target for most projects. Uh, so when we have uh, batch roll projects or when we have some of the cloud or mobile development projects, we expect students to have uh, software solutions which have 80% of test cover. If, it, if it's different, if it's more or less, then you can motivate, right? So you may say, we have this big blob, uh, which we never really use for testing because it's the, this kind of, as I was explaining, like that setting things up and, and, and so on, which kind of adds 
lines of code which are kind of not touched by test cases. And that's why our test coverage is lower. Uh, so it kind of depends how much code you have auto-generated, how much code you have some sort of a, a boilerplate code. For systems which have a lot of boilerplate code, usually your test coverage can be a bit less, right? Uh, because you're testing your code, not the generated stuff. Yeah. Any other questions? But this is a good question. It, it is a little bit of an art, uh, but as I said, like a rule of thumb of 80% is, is a good target to start with. If you see that you cannot hit it, then you can find out why, right? Um, okay, so then slide 19 is about boundary. So we already discussed it with the, with the boundary here. So slide 20, um, it's a continuation of what, um, kind of a test case protocol can look like. So of course we want to automate our tests such that the computer runs them. Uh, but sometimes, you know, if you're doing a human based testing, it's good to have like a, a simple protocol where you have a piece of paper and you say, given those inputs, what is the expected output and what happened, right? And then a human tester will kind of run the system, note all those things and say, yep, you know, the test fail or the test passed. If the test passed, you sort of uh, have a date when the system was following the, the protocol. And then when it failed, you kind of file it to the developers and they will kind of deal with it. Um, so slide number um, 21, this, this goes back to the scope, like what you're testing. Uh, so as I said, you usually start with kind of the smallest unit. Um, and then you can expand into more and more kind of integration style tests all the way to the acceptance test. Acceptance tests are done from the perspective of the user and user story if the system fulfills the user story, basically, right? Uh, and if it doesn't, then the system is not accepted. And if it does, then you, 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 know, you have confirmed that the requirements from the user are kind of fulfilled. Um, all right, so um, the next slide goes into the details, slide 22. They, it, it goes into the details of what is the purpose of a unit test. Um, this is kind of an important aspect because most of the frameworks that you will use are kind of unit test frameworks. And as I said, usually you kind of trying to identify the smallest unit uh, function or a class um, and then you usually instrument the code yourself um, such that you design the test for the function that, that you're kind of writing. Um, slide 22 is about uh, integration testing. So I will um, skip that. Slide 24 is more about integration testing. Uh, what I want to jump into is um so there is a lot of slides about the unit testing later so let's go back to slide 22 and about unit testing and there is a methodology which is called test driven development and test driven development is a slight modification to your normal process of development so your normal process of development is we need this functionality, okay? Uh, to do this, we need those functions or those classes or those methods, okay? Then you write it. Then you sort of check if what you wrote does what you want it to do. And then you write the test, right? So you're kind of implementing stuff first. You're kind of running the stuff manually first. And then you're writing a test to automate those manual checks that you've done, right? So. It can be, for example, um, a method that like, yeah, calculates some sort of a score, like a, a letter score based on those percentages. So you, you write a function which takes a number, it returns the letter score. You kind of manually test if it does that, what you expect. And then you write a test with those five use cases, right? Um, so that's the normal process, but you can turn it around. So what you do is you say, I need a function which calculates the score for those five, um, for, for values between zero and 100. 
And instead of writing that function first, first you write the tests. So you say, I have a function like calculate score. That function takes a number and then it returns a letter. And then I have five use cases. If I pass it minus one, it should throw me an error. If I pass it this and this, it should do this. If I pass it some value here, it should do this. And here it should do this. So you have a test first. And of course, your implementation of the method is not done yet, right? So all your tests fail, right? So your method calculates score, giving a number, giving a letter is returning like nothing or returning empty, empty letter. And then all your tests fail. So then you go back to your, to your implementation and you implement it. And when, when you finish implementing it, you test it. And then you see if some of the tests pass or some of the tests fail. Yeah, thanks. So because you usually you implement it like if the value is between zero and 100, do this, if the value is zero, do that. So those three tests should pass and you probably will not be dealing with the edge conditions or you will probably not be throwing the proper exceptions or whatever. So some tests may fail, some tests may pass. So you go back to the implementation, you, you change it and you go back to tests. When all your tests pass, you're done, right? You don't need to do any manual testing. You don't need to do anything extra. You're basically done. So test driven development is a methodology where you start by writing tests and then, then you do the implementation, right? There, is, there are two big advantages of that. A lot of people are skeptical. They say, oh yeah, I hate writing tests and blah, 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 right? But what convinced me that it's quite good is there are two, two reasons. One reason is, I kind of don't like writing tests. So when I implement something and I have to write tests, I am usually cannot be bothered, right? So I end up not writing tests. So if I start with the test, I have the test no matter what, right? Because I already wrote it, right? If I have a piece of function or function that does something that I want, and I kind of know it does what I want, writing a test to it feels like a waste of time. But if I already wrote the test, then I don't have this dilemma, right? So writing test first is a kind of a psychological trick. Uh, the second thing is that I kind of like before I implement something, before I implement the class or before I implement the method, I kind of like to feel how it would be to use it, right? So like, what is it called? What parameters does it take? Like how it links with other things, how I set things up. So I kind of like to, to play with the API as a programmer to see how it feels to use it, right? What it should return, what it should take as a parameter and so on. So when writing a test, I basically have an uh, opportunity to do that because I don't have the code yet, right? So I'm writing a test for a method which is supposed to calculate that score and I'm thinking what name should it have? Uh, what parameters should it take? What I expect outside? Um, um, I have this kind of a playground to play with my API before it's even done, right? Um, and the reason why it works is because if you start implementing stuff, you end up with those names and those things that sometimes feel a bit ad hoc and inconsistent. But if you start from actually using it, then you end up with stuff that kind of makes sense, right? So if I need a person object, okay, how do I create a person? How I get an age, how I set the name? Like I kind of feel it by writing the example code of how I would be using it. And then when I'm happy, then I kind of actually start implementing it, right? So the ability to kind of do those two things kind of um, is a good reason to do um, uh, test de development first. Okay, any questions on that? Did I convince you to do tests? <laughs> I, I hope so. Uh, you will be given an additional um, task, which will be related to, uh, to testing. So for your projects, you will have to kind of demonstrate that you do have tests in your projects and that you have calculated the test coverage. The test cover is calculated by most of the development tools. You don't need to do anything special. They will just give you a number in percentage, how much cover you have of your tests. Um, there is a number of different um, unit testing frameworks. Uh, so you can, uh, we can discuss it uh, in, with the uh, product owners and we can discuss it later. If you have questions, you can come and discuss it with me uh, because it depends what sort of uh, framework you're using. Uh, in the past, we 
focused on front end testing on JavaScript testing. And this is quite fun because typically when you have a front end and you have some web page to test when things work fine, you have to open the web page, type some stuff in and click a button and see if it does what it's supposed to do. And it's really tedious, right? So if you just have one web, web page, um, okay, that is sort of okay to test, but if you end up with 150 pages and you modified something in your software, and now you need to retest that the whole thing works correctly, then it's impossible, right? So automating that, automating the entry of the text into fields, clicking buttons and doing that kind of uh, in software such that you just sit and wait and all this clicking kind of happens, it's kind of fun, right? It, it needs you to think what to enter into the fields and what buttons to press at what point and what you expect. But once you do it once, then you can run it, you know, multiple times for free. Um, so we kind of, uh, the, the slide which we have, um, not the deck of slides which we have in the Blackboard uh, about some of the tools for unit testing kind of will give you the hint of what you can look into. Uh, if you're doing a front end, if you're doing Go or, or Rust or C++ the, the, or Java, there is a, a Practically for every programming language, you have a unit test framework and you can use it. Um, and um, you can automate the running of the tests with your uh, Git repository in such a way that when you commit to the production branch, all the tests are run automatically. And if any of the tests fails, the commit doesn't happen. So you can only commit code that passes all the tests. So even, even the execution of the test, you don't need to think about it. You're just writing your code, trying to push to the repository. And if everything works fine, it is committed, like pushed. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. So we kind of encourage you to play with those workflows and with integrating of the, uh, of the testing into your, into your systems. So I have to stop now. Do you have questions? What I will do is, because I didn't run through the rest of the slides, the, the rest of the slides are kind of a self-explanatory, to be honest. So you can kind of go through them um, at home. Uh, and I will post the last year uh, remaining of the lecture, which is basically with the same slides, uh, such that you can, um, you can watch it at home as well. And then if you have any questions or any um, uh, problems, kind of integrating testing in your projects, then let me know. Some systems are kind of hard. So for example, if you're building a VR system in Unity with multiple developers and designers, kind of a unit testing, Unity projects is challenging. Uh, you can, you know, you can uh, isolate some C-sharp code for, for testing, but doing the testing of the, of the game or of a system usually needs to have a human in the loop. Uh, so there are situations where you can avoid human in the loop, but um, in most situations you can, and you should, uh, because then you spend some time writing those tests, but then you don't waste time clicking buttons and filling forms and, and doing things like that, right? All right, so I will finish now and um, I will, um, go to this uh, to the lecture. Any of you is, are interested in uh, checking the PhD lecture? No, in Zoom. Zoom guys, are you interested? Um, it's fine. Is so. What? Well, just give me a second, and I will. Um, I will post the link in Zoom. Uh, to where he's doing his um, his lecture. Okay, and I will stop stop recording.